What the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at NoahMoreParties. And in today's video, I'm going to be looking at an interesting backfield that is always different every year, but always somehow useful in fantasy football. And that is the San Francisco 49ers, and in particular, the outlook of Elijah Mitchell going into 2022. Let's do it. <laughs> Okay, so the last few years, like, th there's this reputation in San Francisco that it's just a new guy every year, Kyle Shanahan just rolls the dice or picks out of a hat and has some new running back lead the backfield every year who turns into, like, a useful fantasy starter. I don't really believe that's the case, and I think there's legitimate reasons for his, like, cycling through running backs beyond just Shanahan wants to cycle through running backs. And if you go back to his time... Um, at the beginning of his of his tenure with the 49ers in 2017, his lead running back that year, as far as like carries go, we're looking at, at carry leaders. His lead running back that year was Carlos Hyde. The next season, the lead running back was Matt Breida. What happened to Carlos Hyde? Carlos Hyde was no longer on the team, and so he was unavailable to be the carry leader. So Matt Breida was the lead back in 2018, and then next season... In 2019, it was Tevin Coleman and Raheem Mostert kind of split. I believe they had the same amount of carries. And why was Matt Breida not the carry leader? Well, because Tevin Coleman got a big free agent deal. They brought in a new guy. Matt Breida was just kind of like the placeholder for a year. They brought in Tevin Coleman, and then it ended up being him and Mostert splitting. The next season, in 2020, Jeff Wilson led the team in carries. Why wasn't it Coleman or Mostert? Uh, well... Tevin Coleman suffered a knee sprain in Week 2 and missed 8 games. Raheem Mostert suffered an MCL sprain in Week 2 and high ankle sprains in both Week 6 and Week 14. He also missed 8 games. So Coleman and Mostert were just like unavailable for much of the season, opening the door for Jeff Wilson to lead the team in carries in 2020. The next year, it was not Jeff Wilson. It was Elijah Mitchell, as we know, who came in as a 6th round pick, ended up winning the job, sort of. Why wasn't it Jeff Wilson? A, because Jeff Wilson's not that good, but B, he suffered an ankle sprain in the preseason and tore his meniscus. He missed eight games. And so the door was wide open for Trey Sermon, Elijah Mitchell, you know, whoever it was going to be. And it ended up being Elijah Mitchell. So we have a pattern here of like guys just stepping in as the lead back out of necessity, really, and not, you know, Kyle Shanahan looking at his situation like, oh, well, Matt Breida led the team in carries last year. Fuck Matt Breida. Let's go with Raheem Mostert and then rinse and repeat with some new guy next year. That's not really what's happening here. He He's wanting or at least willing to go with the same guy two years in a row. Guys just keep getting hurt or leaving the team. And so then we come to Elijah Mitchell, who is a former sixth round pick. He doesn't have some sort of unique staying power relative to, you know, Tevin Coleman, Mostert, Breida, Jeff Wilson, all these dudes, you know, relative to previous backs in this offense. But Cal Shanahan cycling through his running backs has been more about like circumstances and the lack of talent insulated opportunity for these running backs than it has been due to Kyle Shanahan's, you know, addiction to switching running backs every year. And so while it's possible that, that you know, Trey Sermon or Tyrion Davis Price, the new third round rookie in this offense, one of those guys like overtakes Elijah Mitchell as the lead back going into the season. If it happens, it'll be A, because Mitchell gets hurt, like, you know, Breida, Mostert, Coleman, Wilson have in the past, or B, it'll be because one of those guys just plays well enough to put you know, Elijah Mitchell on the bench, or maybe a combination of both. Maybe Elijah Mitchell goes down for six weeks with a high ankle sprain or something. Trey Sermon comes in or Tyrion Davis Price comes in and plays really well. Elijah Mitchell comes in. He's a sixth round pick who had like one year of production in an offense where everybody has production. What, what reason does Shanahan have to go back to Mitchell, even if he was playing well before when like Trey Sermon's now playing well in Mitchell's absence? So it's going to be some combination, if this happens, of Mitchell getting hurt, other people just playing better. It won't be, you know, because Shanahan just decides to sit him in order to keep this streak going of random running backs starting every year. And so, these two scenarios, scenario one, or scenario A, is Elijah Mitchell gets hurt. That scenario here is not interesting to me because it's not unique to Elijah Mitchell at all. This could happen to half of the starting running backs in the league. If Cam Akers gets hurt, Daryl Henderson comes in and plays well, who knows if Akers comes back after, you know, a five-week injury absence and retains his job. He's been hurt throughout his career so far. Wouldn't really be his fault, but Daryl Henderson's a good player. Cam Akers does not have, like, high-end job security through a long injury stretch. Same thing with, like, Josh Jacobs. If he got hurt and Zamir White came in, played really well for six weeks, Jacobs is in the last year of his deal. Why would they just give him his job back? James Conner, this could happen to him. If he gets hurt and Keontae Ingram or Daryl Williams or Eno Benjamin comes in and plays really well, James Conner 
was bad on a per touch basis last year, despite scoring a lot of touchdowns. What incentive do they have to just like, you know, give him his starting job back if a younger, more talented running back plays better? Same thing with Leonard Fournette. If he gets hurt, is out for five or six weeks and Rashad White comes in and plays really well, Fournette's probably going back to the bench when he gets healthy. Damian Harris could get hurt and Ramondre Stevenson would just steal his job. Rashad Penny could get hurt and Kenneth Walker would steal his job. This is not unique to Elijah Mitchell. So that scenario is not interesting to me when we're evaluating Elijah Mitchell as like a fantasy asset. Scenario B, where like Tyrion Davis Price or Trey Sermon plays well enough to just put Mitchell on the bench is a little bit more interesting to me. And with Tyrion Davis Price in particular, I would not be shocked to see him perform better than Elijah Mitchell this season. He's not as explosive as Elijah Mitchell. We know Mitchell is one of the most explosive athletic running backs in the league, but I do think that Tyrion Davis Price is a more reliable runner. Uh, he's probably a better pass blocker, things like that. According to relative success rate, which measures on a per touch basis relative to the box counts that you're seeing, how often are you succeeding on your carries relative to your teammates? And so if it's second and eight and you get seven yards, you succeeded on that carry, whether you got seven yards or 20 yards. And so it's, it's not an average. It's just looking at how often are you like putting your team in a better position for the next down for the drive given the situations you're carrying the ball in relative to what other backs on your offense are doing. According to that metric, Tyrion Davis Price was succeeding on 11% more of his runs than his teammates at LSU last season and 9% more of his runs than his teammates at LSU in 2020. Both of those years at the lead back, those are numbers in the 90th and 87th percentiles respectively across all of college football. He was one of the most consistent, reliable runners at just like churning out positive yardage across like all of college football in the last nearly half decade. And so Elijah Mitchell, you know, to kind of contrast last year in the NFL, obviously higher level of competition, but just based on what he was doing on a per carry basis, he was succeeding on his carries less than 2% less off or more than 2% less often than other 49ers running backs were a mark in the 40th percentile for the NFL. And so Elijah Mitchell was leaving a lot of yards in the field last season. He was efficient overall. He's an explosive guy. You know, this, he, he fits this offense. Well, it's like, it's like a one cut, you know, slashing runner who can just like see a hole, put his foot in the ground and go because he's, he's fast and explosive, but he's not a nuanced, you know, really skilled technical runner yet at this point in his development. And it's possible that this coaching staff likes that, you know, turns out maybe they like that Davis Price doesn't leave as many yards on the field as Elijah Mitchell does, doesn't take as many negative plays, is just a more reliable, consistent runner on a per carry basis. That's very possible this season. What about Trey Sermon? I think Trey Sermon offers some similar things as Tyrion Davis Price, but I'm slightly less worried about him eating into Mitchell's workload. A, he already landed in the doghouse last season and essentially put up a year one zero. He wasn't efficient on his 41 carries, a box adjusted efficiency rating, which measures how efficient is he relative to his teammates given the box counts that he's seeing uh, in the 29th percentile. So very inefficient and a relative success rate. He was, he was, uh, 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 and a relative success rate 5% lower than other backs on the team. So really low. That's in the 27th percentile. He's one of the worst backs in the league on a per touch basis last season. Only 41 carries, but A, it's not positive that he got. However, Sermon was really good in his last two years of college. He had 85th percentile or greater box adjusted efficiency ratings at Oklahoma and Ohio State his last two years. 68th percentile or greater in relative success rate at Oklahoma and Ohio State in his last two years. And so while I think he's a, probably a pretty good runner, he just doesn't fit the mold of a Shanahan running back. Like he's six feet tall, 215 pounds, ran a 4.61 at his pro day. And if you look at these guys in San Francisco from, you know, Shanahan's kind of tenure as the head coach here, Matt Breida, 195 pounds, 4.39 in the 40. Raheem Mostert, 205 pounds, 4.43 in the 40. Tevin Coleman, 206 pounds, 4.45 in the 40. Jarek McKinnon, 209 pounds, 4.41 in the 40. Tyrion Davis Price was 2.11, ran 4.48 at the combine. But I think he slimmed down quite a bit for that 40. Uh, Going back to his time as like a high school recruit, he was listed at 235 pounds. During his three years at LSU, he was listed at 226, 232, and 223. He like starved himself the couple days leading up to the combine. He must have in order to get down to get under 4.5 in the 40. And so even TDP is kind of a weird fit here, but less of a stretch than Trey Sermon, who's like a legitimate 215, 220 pound back who runs a 4.6. So he's not one of these guys while he's like a skilled runner, like a good instinctive back. He didn't perform well last year, and he doesn't have that, like, just put his foot in the ground and go in this, like, outside zone, you know, find a hole and go as fast as you can through it scheme that Shanahan likes to run. 
as evidenced by like the guys that he's given volume in the past. They're all around 200 pounds and they all are really fast. Trey Sermon is neither of those things. So while if I was ranking these three running backs on like a pure talent eval, I'd probably go Trey Sermon, Davis Price, Elijah Mitchell in that order top to bottom. But I think that's the opposite of how this pecking order will shake out. And like most people are assuming that given the ADPs of these of these players. And so if we go back to Elijah Mitchell, last year he finished as the RB14 on a points per game basis in PPR leagues with the number three opportunity share in the league and the 13th most carries in the league despite missing six games with injury. He's not going to touch those numbers this year. This is what Kyle Shanahan said after drafting Tyrion Davis Price. I quote, Sometimes you can have good luck with guys staying healthy, sometimes not. So the more guys you can add, the better. The physicality he, Tyrion Davis Price, the physicality he brings gives you the chance to have a very physical one-two punch. I thought Debo Samuel helped us do that towards the end of last year, bringing that in, but you don't want that to be just your one-two punch. You've got to bring in some other backs to do that. Trey Sermon, Elijah Mitchell, Raheem Mostert, and Jeff Wilson all missed significant time with injuries last year. I already ran through Shanahan's history in San Francisco with his running backs. He's been ravaged. This backfield has been ravaged by injuries every single year, losing the main guy from the year before. He's spoken to... You know, this this idea he has in his head where, like, he wants to mix in more guys, he wants a one-two punch, he wants to keep these guys healthy. An underrated scenario C is that this backfield turns into a committee. It kind of already was, you know, sort of trending that way with Debo Samuel playing the banger role at the end of last season. But Shanahan wants to preserve the health of his players. He wants to have a one-two punch. He doesn't sound like a coach comfortable handing Elijah Mitchell an 80% opportunity share again. And so... You know, what if Elijah Mitchell doesn't have an 80% opportunity share again? If he doesn't have that workload, he's cooked. Let's say he gets a 65% opportunity share, which would still be higher than Christian McCaffrey's, would still be higher than Saquon Barkley's, higher than Nick Chubb's, higher than Ezekiel Elliott's opportunity shares from last season. If we give him, if we drop him from 80% opportunity share to 65% opportunity share, still pretty high relative to really talented backs across the league, he would lose 2.2 points per game just from his rushing stats from last season, which would bring him from 15 points per game to 12.8 points per game, which drops him from the RB14 on a points per game basis to the RB22. He's currently being drafted in the mid-fifth round as the RB24 within picks of guys like J.K. Dobbins, Josh Jacobs, Brees Hall, and A.J. Dillon. Most of those guys who, A, don't need the kind of workload that Elijah Mitchell has in order to be, like, fantasy relevant. A.J. Dillon is going to split 50-50 and be productive in fantasy football. J.K. Dobbins has already split essentially 50-50 with Gus Edwards and been productive in fantasy football. Elijah Mitchell's value, especially relative to some of those other guys, is very fragile given how much it depends on other running backs basically not seeing the field in San Francisco. And while I don't think we have to assume that Elijah Mitchell will just lose his job because Shanahan... Tyrion Davis Price is currently being drafted at RB69. Trey Sermon is currently being drafted at RB75. These other guys are currently being priced as if they just won't see the field in San Francisco. The difference in ADP or in ranking between Elijah Mitchell and Trey Sermon or Elijah Mitchell and Tyrion Davis Price is one of the largest gaps between a lead running back and his presumed backups among any running backs in fantasy football right now. This is a low-key ambiguous committee backfield being treated in fantasy drafts like it's one clear lead back with a couple of useless backups. I don't think that's the case at all. I think the touch distribution is going to be much flatter in San Francisco this year. I'm taking shots in the late rounds on Tyrion Davis Price and Trey Sermon and letting someone else draft Elijah Mitchell as if he's going to get a Saquon Barkley-level workload.